Welcome to this special presentation of Investing in Psychedelics, brought to you by the Canadian Securities Exchange in partnership with CFN Media. today for a very specific reason. This is the launch of our uh, partnered event that we're doing with CFN Media and it's investing in psychedelics. I, I don't think I ever thought that I'd be hosting an interview like this, Richard, with you, <laughs> but here we are, uh, pandemic 2020, sitting in our homes, having a discussion around psychedelics and then coming to our marketplace. So um, why don't we why don't we dive into it a little bit as far as what how do we feel about the sector? as an exchange? Well, Anna, this is obviously very timely because uh, uh, we've certainly been approached uh, by a number of companies that are uh, looking to raise public capital and uh, list on the exchange. And uh, we've also been uh, meeting with a number of investors that are looking for opportunities uh, in, in the space. And uh, it's obviously topical. And uh, we've had, I guess, uh, two or three companies now hit the public markets in Canada. Uh, that are looking to pursue opportunities in the psychedelic uh, uh, sector. And uh, so there's uh, really a lot to talk about. There's a lot going on, a lot of energy uh, in this, uh, in the particular sector. But basically, um, from a uh, listings perspective, um, we're really looking for the same sort of disclosure that we saw out of the cannabis issuers back in the day. Uh, there is a guidance bulletin from the Canadian Securities Administrators there's also uh, guidance from uh, the Canadian Securities Exchange as well to companies in the cannabis space that really speaks to the kind of disclosure issues that companies that are operating businesses that may not be legal in Canada or the United States, let's say, but that are looking to pursue opportunities in international jurisdictions uh, where those undertakings are, in fact, legal. So there are some special disclosure considerations uh, around that. There is... Uh, work that we need and disclosure around uh, how these companies are conducting themselves in those uh, international jurisdictions, what the compliance programs look like, what the local regulatory framework uh, uh, is, and uh, how they're proposing to regulate uh, the particular undertaking that the company is, uh, is doing. So I would, uh, as I say, first uh, look at the kinds of disclosure considerations that, uh, as I say, the cannabis companies uh, were looking at uh, in, the, uh, in the early days of the development of that industry in the public markets. Well, and I think I think that probably hits the nail on the head. I mean, we, we're open for business to, uh, you know, all sectors, as long as they meet the disclosure requirements and meet our listing requirements, which is pretty straightforward. Um, so we are welcoming these companies is, is what you're saying in general. And, and, and for guidance, you know, this is where I think, especially these sectors, it's important for issuers to really um, make sure that they have good legal counsel and a good team around them to make sure they're meeting all of those disclosure requirements. We saw it in the cannabis space. I think there was um, there was a review done by the CSA and something about I think it was seventy four percent of companies weren't providing proper disclosure. So you know the, the yeah. And now, uh, the now in, in fairness to those companies, though, Anna, sorry, sorry to jump in. No worries. Uh, but a, a lot of the shortfalls were related to um, uh, some pretty arcane uh, provisions in the uh, accounting rules uh, for biologics. Um, which were very difficult for the companies themselves to, um, you know, basically discover what the industry standard was going to be. Um, so, and, and this was particularly uh, for the uh, uh, companies that were engaged in cultivation. Uh, so there were some very challenging accounting issues and it's, uh, it's taking a little while for the industry to basically come to grips with what the right standards are. Um, in the uh, psychedelic space, um, it's a, you know, we're not going to have those kinds of, uh, accounting issues, I think, present themselves. Uh, although I suppose uh, some folks are, uh, cultivating, uh, mushrooms and, uh, and they in fact may come up, but, um, no, the, the principal difference between the, uh, cannabis space, uh, which obviously raised a tremendous amount of money in the public markets and, uh, you know, has launched, uh, the most uh, exciting uh, new consumer packaged goods uh, industry in generations, uh, in, in, in my view, in North America. But the psychedelic side is really much more of a uh, medical or pharmacological uh, business. 
uh, that uh, that these companies are looking to address. Um, you know, we see obviously a number of different takes on it. Um, some of them are looking to, uh, if I can use the phrase, uh, promote a, a form of medical tourism. Uh, where uh, you can uh, travel to a jurisdiction uh, in which uh, a number of these different compounds are illegal and uh, seek treatment for depression, uh, addiction, uh, PTSD, and other, um, generally speaking, uh, mental health conditions, uh, which uh, may have resisted uh, conventional treatments, um, or companies that... uh, more along the lines of uh, uh, pharmacological research companies uh, are looking to, uh, uh, in a scientific, uh, rigorous fashion, um, research the uh, therapeutic uh, benefits and potential side effects of these compounds uh, on a number of different uh, uh, physical and mental health uh, concerns. So that is obviously a path that's uh, well-regulated, well-understood, uh, from the uh, from the pharma industry, um, and uh, I guess what's encouraging for both the companies and potential investors in this in the space is that uh, you know I guess in some respects there's a lot of stigma attached uh, to to this as there was with with cannabis, but in the case of uh, LSD and uh, ketamine and MDMA and some of the other psychedelic compounds, there's some some old but uh, still significant clinical research from the 50s, early 60s, uh, that does suggest, uh, in fact, quite powerful impact uh, on a number of different uh, health concerns. And what we've seen in response, and and we've had a few companies already, um, that uh, 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 they're being advanced or fast-tracked through the clinical trial process. So that instead of the typical um, uh, way of things where you start preclinical, phase one, phase two, phase three, um, some of these companies are being permitted to go straight to phase two, uh, skip two steps uh, because of the uh, both historic uh, uh, clinical research that was done and the very powerful positive results. Um, that some of these compounds had uh, with a variety of, uh, of health conditions. So um, it's not necessarily going to be as long, as slow a build as some of the pharma compounds. Um, and so uh, the likelihood of things happening a little faster, it's still going to be a long, slow build. But um, as I say, they've been able to advance a, a few steps in, in, in very short order. Well, I think, and one thing that's interesting about the sector that we experience in the cannabis space is that this is not a new sector by any means. It's thousands of years old. And there's actually probably been more research done on the um, psychedelic space than the cannabis space. And and I say that without actually knowing if that's true or not, but Uh, LSD, LSD for sure. Yeah. And, and so, but, but what it is unique in this scenario that we went through in the cannabis space is it's brand new to the capital markets. Um, and I think that there's going to be a lot of, there's going to be a lot of, um, people thinking this is very similar to the cannabis space. There's going to be a lot of anticipation. There's a lot of excitement around it. Some people that feel that they missed out on the cannabis space are going to want to jump in feet first. What are your thoughts as far as to the sectors, um, you know, having some similar, some similarities and yet potentially some big differences? Yeah, I I think the differences are far greater than the similarities uh, to be, to be blunt. Um, because this is not a case where uh, people are talking about legalizing uh, LSD, mushrooms, and various other substances uh, for adult recreational use. It's not going to be a consumer packaged good. It's not going to be available down at the uh, dispensary or uh, you know at your shopper's drug mart or what have you. Um, instead, uh, the potential, uh, which is enormous in dollar terms, is uh, having these uh, compounds as basically uh, prescription-based drugs uh, to treat a variety of uh, mental and uh, physical health issues. And as I mentioned before, to do that, you have to go through the uh, clinical trials, which are required by the FDA in the United States and Health Canada in Canada, 
Um, and it is a very expensive proposition. And it takes a while uh, for, for companies to, to get through that. The other thing is, and I'm, I'm certainly no expert in um, serious investment in the uh, pharma industry as well. But of course, the pharma companies are always looking at their pipeline of drugs for particular uh, issues, health issues. And so they need to be, or ideally, they want to have a series of drugs cut in the pipeline to replace existing drugs that are going to be coming off of patent. Um, and as a result, the margins will be compressed because the generic manufacturers will get in there and, um, and uh, sell the, the drugs at, uh, at a significantly lower cost because, of course, the generic manufacturers didn't have to undertake all of the research expense associated with getting that drug to market. Um, so the other thing that can drive uh, the availability uh, of these uh, uh, drugs in the market is what does a particular pharma company's um, uh, pipeline look like? Uh, do they have a gap coming? Is there a, and again, I have no idea where, for example, Xanax is uh, in its uh, life cycle, um, which I believe is the drug most commonly uh, prescribed uh, for uh, depressive illnesses at this point. Um, but, uh, and I may be wrong on that too, but uh, it certainly has been a multi, multi-billion dollar drug in terms of its uh, revenues that's been, that have been generated. But again, is there something else in the pipeline that's ahead of uh, a psychedelic compound? Like what, at what point would these um, pharma companies be looking to bring these uh, products to the, to the mass market? And uh, Again, it's it's not necessarily a question of is this the most effective drug to treat a particular compound. It it may be, you know, the profitability uh, of the drug and the ability to uh, market it to a, a, a wide audience, not just in Canada, the United States, but uh, but globally. You know, these are all considerations uh, for the pharma industry that people do need to keep in mind uh, when they think about this uh, this developing sector. Well, and uh, you know, that's such an interesting point. I think typically that, um, that bottleneck at the pharma companies, we don't know what's down the pipeline. I think there's going to be a huge demand for this product as, as being used. So you might see it pushed through further than others. I was just thinking of, as you were describing that, it sounds very much like this is going to, and maybe it always has been a similar model to, you know, the big miners out there that they kind of let the junior companies go and do the exploration work. And you're kind of just hoping that you, you find a reserve and get bought out by one of the big guys and and maybe do you think that's kind of what we might see and, and, uh, that is exactly right um, and the pharma companies have been doing this for years that uh, the amount of uh, primary or early stage research that uh, the majors do now is is negligible or non-existent and instead um, investors uh, retail investors or foot you the know, bill they foot the bill because at the high risk stage yeah uh, then the, of course, the interesting uh, challenge for the executives of these junior companies is um, to advance uh, to advance the project. Exactly like in the in the mining space, uh, will take significant uh, uh, amount of capital. And so, uh, do you raise more from the uh, public markets and dilute your existing shareholders? Do you do joint ventures um, with? Um, uh, because there's there's certainly private equity out there that is uh, very skilled and, and knowledgeable uh, in the pharma space. Uh, do you do joint ventures uh, with the uh, with the majors? Um, so it's it is in fact very very similar uh, to the uh, to the mining industry in terms of uh, how these uh, projects are advanced. Now, do you think that we're going to see um, a flow of our cannabis companies want to venture out into this space. I feel like that might be something that our issuers are going to look for as maybe even a subsidiary, or do you think that they'll remain pretty separate in the marketplace? Well, there's a, I think there's a couple of ways of looking at it. Um, in, in North America, where adult recreational use is the source of most revenues and potential profits for the cannabis space, um, I think it will more likely be the pharma companies that are advancing these projects. But internationally, um, most parts of the world where, can, where the rules around cannabis are being liberalized, generally speaking, it's for medical purposes. Yeah. So you, you'll be in the medical sphere, um, again, having to have government approvals and uh, prescriptions being filled, uh, basically 
for, um, you know, to use cannabis in response to whatever issues, uh, whether it's uh, anxiety, depression, um, you know, what pain management, uh, what, what have you. And I think it's a, it's, it's quite likely a much more, um, uh, a neater fit for those companies that are active in the medical space to add to the portfolio of products uh, with, uh, uh, with with compounds uh, uh, from the, uh, the the psychedelic sphere, but as I say, to to get these drugs into the position where they are uh, potential multi billion dollar revenue um, uh, compounds is really going to take big pharma uh, in order to do that. I think, and so. Um, I think that's where the money is going to be made is uh, uh, the companies that advance these uh, the research around these compounds uh, to the point where uh, they attract the attention of the uh, of the major pharmaceutical companies in the world. Well, and some of the so I've just been learning about this myself. And I and here's the thing, too, is it's a it's an interesting sector because I think we all have an emotional um, understanding to it. So people say mushrooms or they say psychedelics and we all giggle, I think, a little bit in our head. But you 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 made a really good point there. This is very much a pharmaceutical play is very much to assist with some very serious psychological issues. Um, this is far from a recreational play at this stage. Um, and who knows where things will go from there. But I think the part that makes us giggle a little bit is going to be in every retail investor's mind as well. They invest in cannabis. Some of them made a lot of money and they're kind of coming at it that way, but they very much are, very separate plays in the end. Um, and I think, I think the opportunity though, as you said, is so much bigger. The money that is funneled into, um, antidepressants, anti-anxiety medication, um, as well as, you know, kind of all the other sphere, uh, post-traumatic stress syndrome, um, all the things that it covers is, is quite big. Um, I think the one thing, the real outliers in the sector are going to be the fact that we don't yet, and this is where the research is going to, there's no knowledge yet as to being able to take the compounds, take the compounds, put them in a certain stable state and say to somebody, take two of these a day for this long, and it will help you with these pro with, with your issues. Um, the real benefits that they've seen well, so far well, of is... <laughs> And, and, and of course, that, that's, uh, you know, that, that's one of the big issues for, for big pharma, because um, those are exactly the kind of drugs they love. Yeah. Uh, whereas, uh, uh, again, I've had the privilege of, uh, of uh, meeting with some of the pioneers um, in the space. And um, from a, a, a severe depression perspective, um, the LSD treatment may only be uh, somewhere between six and nine visits to the physician. Right. And right. then and significant changes are seen. So so that's not necessarily a very profitable uh, pivot uh, from uh, a Xanax, which uh, people, I don't, I, again, I, I, I'm not sure what the dosage, uh, whether it's on an as needed basis or whether it's on a daily basis. But again, uh, something where uh, it's, it's much more like having surgery uh, once uh, than having to, um, in effect, uh, uh, you know, create a revenue stream for the pharma company for the rest of your life. Have you ever seen, um, because again, our markets are so, they're such a different beast than, than the senior markets. Have you ever seen um, a pharmaceutical play in the junior markets before? Uh, yes, absolutely. And, 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 what, and, we, and, and we saw we saw a bunch in the uh, in the cannabis space that were quite specifically uh, aimed at the um, at the uh, 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 medical or uh, looking at medical opportunities. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, there there are numerous uh, companies which are single compound research entities, just like a junior mining exploration company that is uh, uh, working a particular property, and. Um, uh, they are doing the pre-clinicals. -clin, pre uh, uh, we have a few on the Canadian Securities Exchange. There are others on uh, other exchanges in Canada. Uh, there are a couple of uh, specialty uh, dealers that uh, uh, support these uh, companies with uh, capital and research and uh, investment banking advice. Um, but it is a very, very specialized sector. Very. Um, you know, the 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 analysts need to be 
uh, PhD uh, chemists uh, or pharmacologists or, or what have you. Um, and uh, as I say, it's very, very specialized knowledge. Um, the, the other thing is that uh, in the United States, there is an enormous private equity uh, community that is uh, devoted to uh, funding this space particularly and specifically as well. And uh, again, a tremendous amount of intellectual horsepower um, at these uh, funds uh, that are looking for different investment opportunities uh, around the world. Um, again, um, looking not perhaps just at uh, therapeutic efficacy, but obviously uh, the the profitability of the approach uh, that uh, you know this this particular compound might afford. So um, yeah, it's a it's pretty well trodden space. Um, I think people are looking at the public markets for financing here because, as you say, there's a tremendous amount of, uh, of retail enthusiasm, uh, probably in part um, brought on by the um, uh, success and uh, interest that people may have had in the cannabis uh, in the cannabis space. But as I say, I would caution that uh, you know this uh, this is likely to be a very different uh, part of uh, the investment landscape, um, given that, as I say, it's it's generally speaking a a pharma, um, pharmaceutical play, uh, as opposed to a, a recreational or wellness type uh, initiative. Well, and I think you bring up a good point. We were chatting about this earlier. First of all, there there is um, a lovely wealth of data um, from historical research that's been done. Um, so, as an investor, I think you're pretty lucky. It's it's a little bit of a different play than cannabis. It's it's easy to go out there and find some of the research and data that was created in the past. Um, you know, some that's being created right now. So as an investor, you know, uh, we always urge um, our investors to, you know, get to know the sector before you, th you write checks to it. But also we were talking about this It's it's important for people to, um, you know, let's learn from the cannabis side of things and let's make sure that some of these companies have the fundamentals. And if you don't have the fundamentals because it's research and development that you have the, um, you know, the, the thought leaders and the, um, experts in the fate in, in the space that are helping you kind of guide your guide, the development of your company and, and your product. Um, but do you see this as, um, do you see this as an ability to the, the billions of dollars that were raised in the cannabis space? Do you think we'll see that again in this sector? What does your crystal ball tell you? I, I almost want to say, I hope not. Um, because that would uh, suggest that uh, there were literally hundreds of companies out there pursuing the opportunity. And uh, to be blunt, I don't think there's that kind of room um, because, uh, again, the, there are only a relatively small number of uh, global-scale pharma companies which will be in a position to bring products to market, right. um, and um, which, which suggests to you that... Uh, uh, of the companies that are doing early stage research, if, if that's in fact the you know the business plan that they're pursuing, uh, it'll only be a small handful of companies that are in fact successful uh, in advancing their projects and uh, doing deals uh, with the uh, with the majors. Well, and but I think I, and sorry, well, I, I was going to say, I mean, it's it's always important to to have a look at management and their track record. Yeah. Uh, it is utterly critical uh, in this space to understand uh, the, the, the talent and bench strength uh, from a scientific perspective in these, uh, in these companies. Absolutely. Um, this Absolutely. is a, a very, very demanding uh, you know, part of the world. Yeah. And I think you're totally right. I mean, cannabis, it has that recreational element, which is just endless. I mean, you know, there can be 10 Coca-Cola is not that there could be, but you know what I mean? I mean, the recreational side is huge. This is a very, very different play. I would also, it'll be interesting to see, you know, some of the, I have seen a few cannabis companies look at kind of bring this apart in. hopefully they're bringing the experts with them because, you know, doing, um, doing a cannabis play, you want to make sure that you have your experts in, in the psilocybin or the uh, psychedelic play as well. Well, I listen, I'm, I'm kind of excited to watch this happen. I think everybody else is. I'm excited for the CSE. I think that I think you and our listings department and our team as a whole, I think we did a really great job of, of fostering the cannabis sector, making sure that you know, our companies were doing it with integrity and doing it with the proper disclosure requirements. Um, so I'm excited to see what's going to happen here. 
Yeah, and I think, uh, uh, again, we're probably only weeks away from having a, uh, I'm not going to say a large number, but certainly a, a handful of companies which are on the exchange um, looking to uh, advance uh, particular projects. And uh, as I say, I, I, what, 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 what has moved me off of the stigma component was uh, listening to some of the leaders in the research space um, speak uh, over the last few months um, at uh, just how uh, powerful um, these drugs are in addressing, uh, in particular, uh, addiction. And we know that we've got a tremendous uh, opioid, opioid uh, addiction problem in North America. Yeah. And, um, and depressive illness, which, uh, you know, in terms of uh, you know, cost of the economy and uh, um, the the cost of the drugs that uh, are currently prescribed, uh, uh, and you know, in in, in many cases, uh, not all that effectively, as I understand. Um, it's uh, the the promise um, that uh, some of these compounds uh, hold is is really exciting, and uh, it will be. Um, I, I I hope that uh, we're able to foster the companies that. Uh, are the ones that can genuinely make an int- uh, a, a real difference in, in, in people's lives. Um, but, and I think that's really important too. You know, you talk about the opioid addiction. We're having this discussion in a very, very trying time um, for humankind across the globe. Uh, people being stuck in homes that are difficult situations, people without uh, jobs, people suffering from anxiety, depression, um, you know, and I think more and more as a society, we're coming to the conclusion that we need to get back to our roots and some of these natural products. Um, you know, are really the the way to to go. And and also, I don't know if, as a society if we've ever been more aware of people's mental health issues. We promote it now. We discuss it openly. You know, it's a part of our society to try and help people through it. So I think it's coming at a very, very timely manner to market. And um, like I said, I look forward to seeing some of the good work it will hopefully do. Absolutely. Anna. No, really excited to see that uh, come to pass. I guess, uh, Richard, when we can travel again, we might we might find ourselves traveling to psychedelic conferences. <laughs> that might be next on the roster, if you can believe it. <laughs> there, I'm, I'm giggling again, but uh, I know well, right? I, I've, I've already been I've already been to some. Uh, oh, so geez. it's uh, Without me? (laughs) (laughs) Well, listen, thank you again for your insights, Richard. I really appreciate it. Um, We are having this conversation because we're launching a series um, on psychedelics. Uh, We are also doing a series that will be launched on June 10th with MNP and Erdin Burles that, Richard, you'll be a part of, I believe, as well. Um, Mm -hmm. So June 10th, registration information is on our website. And June 17th, we're doing in partnership with CFN Media. You can meet a bunch of companies in the private sector, a bunch of companies that are listed with us already. Um, You can talk to bankers who are going to talk about their investment mandate and their analysis of the sector. Um, As well, we have a bunch of really well-renowned doctors who will be talking about, um, you know, the history of it all, um, some of the data collection, some of the research that's been done, and some of the applications of how it's being used today. So please register, sign up, and join us for the series. And thank you again, Richard, for helping me launch off this series. My pleasure, Anna. Thank you. Thanks.